Um, so hello and welcome to Heartland National TB Center's webinar, Let's Hash Out the Drug Rash. This webinar is hosted by us, Heartland National TB Center and NTNC. Um, my name is Andrea Moreno Vasquez. I am a training and education developer at Heartland National TB Center. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce my three lovely colleagues, Catalina Navarro, Mariel Monreal, and Iris Barrera. Catalina has served as a manager for Outpatient Medical Center for eight years in Bogota, Colombia. Once in the United States, she worked as a gastrointestinal and vascular nurse at a local hospital in San Antonio for three years. Now at Heartland National TB Center, she serves as a nurse consultant and educator and assists in the case management of U.S. and Mexico patients with TB. Maribel comes from, the public, from public health nursing with the city of San Antonio, and she has worked as a medical, surgical, and telemetry nurse in the past and is a graduate of UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing. Maribel is also the loving mother of an adorable pit bull named Junior. Finally, Iris Barrera is a registered nurse consultant and educator with the Heartland National TB Center. She previously enjoyed working as the TB program manager and communicable disease coordinator for Hayes County Local Health Department and is the recipient of the International DAISY Award for Extraordinary Nurses. Other nursing experience includes intensive care and medical surgical nursing. Please welcome Maribel, Iris, and Catalina, and let's hash out the drug rash. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Andrea. And so without further ado, because we do have a lot of information we want to cover, we're going to get started. I will say um, that we are going to be saving questions for the end of the presentation. And um, there will be uh, trainers moderating that area, but feel free to discuss the content between yourselves. And then hopefully if we have time at the end of the presentation, we can get to those things. So let's go ahead and get started. So the goal of this presentation is to provide a foundation for the public health nurse, so yourself, to aid in the management of TB drug rash. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe the characteristics of a drug rash, also identify the medications associated with TB drug rash, identify mild, moderate, and severe reactions such as Dress and Steven Johnson syndrome, and also discuss nursing management including your assessment, possible interventions, and then evaluation. So I'm a big fan of laughing. I know you all are at lunch right now, so we thought it would be a good idea to put this clip in here. So I love Seinfeld, and when I knew we were doing a rash webinar, I said, man, we have to find this clip. Edgar is awesome. He found it. And so I hope you guys can hear it. Please turn up your speakers. This is really funny. Um, and so without further ado, um, Jerry Seinfeld on the itch. <laughs> Um, other things that might go through uh, nurses' minds are give them Benadryl and send them home, 
Do I want to just jump straight to drawing labs? Do I just want to do nothing but put this in the doctor's lap and call the doctor? Or do I want to perform a thorough nursing assessment? So as wonderful as hiding would be, I did choose to perform a thorough nursing assessment. But where do you start? Um, a rash is, you know, hopefully not something we see all the time in our clinics, and so it's hard to kind of remember what the components are, what should I be doing, what should come first. So the things we're going to cover is the physical assessment, also gathering of episode-specific information, like the history surrounding this reaction, and then we're going to discuss whether or not, you know, we're going to be obtaining things like laboratory results, and drawing labs, and other data. We're going to start with the physical assessment. So when the patient comes in and they've got something that's red and itchy or something that's visually concerning to them, um, not to mention subjectively concerning to them, we want to save the questions kind of. I mean, we can ask questions as we're assessing, but go ahead and just start to do that physical assessment. You're going to observe the patient's reaction for the location. So you're going to want to know exactly where this is at. Now, is this on the arms, legs, torso? It can also be on the face, hands, feet. Keep in mind, rashes can also be on the scalp and the genital area, also the buttock. So you want to do a thorough um, assessment of this patient's reaction. And then know whether it's bilateral or not. Also texture. Is it raised, flat, scaly even? Um, are there pustules? Are there some ruptured pustules? Um, if so, what color is the fluid? Um, is there sloughing? Um, and with a drug rash, it's usually a macular papular type of reaction, um, which we'll get into here in a little bit. You also want to note the color. Is it red? Is it purple? Um, if it's not too painful to the patient with a gloved hand, you're going to want to blanch that. So apply gentle pressure and see if it blanches to the touch. How big is it? Is it pinpoint? Would you consider it small, large? Um, and is it distributed diffusely, or is it localized? And so diffuse is kind of when there's no well-defined lines around it. It's kind of just a smudge of this reaction, um, and it's kind of everywhere. Localized is usually when there's some lines, there's some definite um, borders to it. Also, you can check if it's warm to the touch. And then also, any time a patient is experienced in a rash, you want to make sure you inspect their oral mucosa. So you want to make sure that you're giving that um, information to the doctor. You know, is there anything going on in the mouth, any sores or anything like that? <clears throat> but are we missing something? So, you know, the patient comes in. I know I'm kind of in a hurry. I'm kind of distracted. Say my ride's waiting outside, um, and it can be easy to do. So that's why it's a good idea when you have a patient with um, these type of cutaneous reactions to disrobe to, you know, a comfortable level of providing privacy. Many times the patient is not aware of the severity of their reaction. Um, the other thing I want to share is reference material. So um, I got this um, off the Internet. It's something that you could definitely print out in full color, laminate, and keep at your desk. Um, and it's something that you want to do prior to your patient showing up with a reaction. So, you know, in TB, it's not if a patient's going to have a cutaneous reaction, it's when they're going to have this reaction. Um, and so you want to be prepared for that eventuality. Um, so the good thing about having one of these aids um, available is that it helps to guide your assessment and documentation of this patient. Um, you can have them come in, you can do your assessment, you can call the doctor on the phone, but if you didn't document it, um, you know, how are you going to know when you come back, say, Monday or something, what you saw versus what you're seeing now? Um, and so these aids are going to help you with that. So if you look up there to the top and then the right-hand side, you see the papule. So papular, you know, describes kind of like a little bit of a, a rise, um, and you can see that it does say it's papular because it's palpable. Um, other things you can use to describe um, the rash, and there's a lot of good verbiage in here, is um, th the uh, a large fluid-filled blister, so is it blistery? Is there dried serum? Um, is there exudate on the skin? Um, is there purpura? Um, that's a very good term to use to describe things. Um, and then also... Uh, Scaling, so visible flaking. Um, is there a macule with the purpura, a larger macule? Um, these are all terms you can pull in to the description of your patient's reaction so that when you are communicating it to your team, they can visualize, they know what it is you're talking about. Um, 
And then in addition to having something like this at your desk in your clinic um, is this link that I've provided. Um, and so it's a very good link because it's dermatology terms, um, just so it's something you can refresh on every so often. Um, the, basically, the bigger your vocabulary when it comes to describing your patient's reaction, the better your doctor's um, interventions are going to be and the quicker your patient is going to um, see resolution. So after you've done a thorough physical assessment, you want to make sure you start asking them, asking them questions that are going to get you information about how this came about. So some questions to ask the patient are if they're allergic to any medications. Now, I know a lot of people might seem like, oh, well, you know, we've already asked them that question. But a lot of our PD patients are on medication for upwards of six months or more. And they can actually develop um, allergies while they're on TD medication. Um, this other question three down, you know, what other medications or remedies have you been taking? Um, you know, there's patients who start antibiotics for other reasons um, whenever they're on their TD medications and they might not share that with you. Um, so you're going to want to ask them any, any new allergies or are you taking any new medications or are you taking any even, you know, um, herbal remedies, anything like that. You're also going to want to ask them, are there any other allergies that they have other than drugs? Are there food allergies? Um, there's just all kinds of things out there. Hypersensitivity is a big thing right now. And then also, when did they first notice the reaction? Um, is it itchy or is it painful? And then have they been using a different detergent? I mean, really, you know, any changes in their lifestyle, you know, that um, they might be able to attribute this to, we want to get that information. Because um, it is important to uh, make sure that the, this is a true drug rash. So, you know, when it comes to a drug rash, the typical symptoms do include redness, bumps, blisters, hives, that macular papular hives, itching, and sometimes peeling and pain. Every drug a person takes may have to be stopped to figure out which one is causing the rash. And then the other thing to share is that most drug rashes do resolve once that drug is stopped. So if you've done your assessment, you've gotten to this point, and you're thinking, you know, this could really be um, because of their TB medication, um, some other things you want to ask them is, how long after your dose of medication did this rash occur? Was it minutes, hours, or days? Um, and then, has this happened before with this medication? So I know, um, for instance, there's been many times where I've had patients who they had milder reactions um, with previous doses of medication. Maybe they had some itching, but there was no rash, and they disregarded it. Um, or maybe they had a little rash, but it went away so quickly they didn't see anything. This could be increasing sensitivity, and this is definitely something that you're going to want to gather and you're going to want to, the doctor to know. And then also, um, you're going to want to ask them if they've taken anything for that rash. So, you know, if the doctor's going to make res recommendations, you want to make sure that we're not giving them too much of something that they've already taken. So ask them, have you taken anything for the rash? So this is a nice little exercise that I want you guys to do with me right now. Um, and this is just an image that I got off the Internet. This is not a patient of mine. But this is actually a lot like what my patient's rash looked like. So, you know, using some of the things we've gone over, some of the terms we've talked about, think about what the location of this rash would be. Also think about the distribution. You know, how would you describe this to your physician? What color would you call this? What kind of texture? I know you can't feel it, but just by looking at the pictures, what kind of texture would you call it? And is there any additional um, observations you can make about this? So I went ahead and put in just some of my um, thoughts on this. And, you know, by no means are these all inclusive. But, you know, I mean, even just having a, a simple description of the rash is really going to help the physician in responding to this patient's reaction. So for me, you know, this is on the arm. Um, it's diffusely distributed. There's not a lot of really well good borders or anything like that. Um, it's red. I can say that for my patient, and this is almost exactly what uh, theirs look like, it did blanch. Um, the texture appears to be flat. Um, it's scaling a little bit. And then also you can see a plaque up on the kind of upper arm near the armpit that may not be related to the drug rash. This patient could have some underlying psoriasis or something. And then additional information that you can share with the physician is that maybe this is warm to the touch. So now we're back to the, the, the patient that I had in the clinic. And, you know, as you can see, I did stay. It's now 5.30, so it took about a half an hour to do that, um, that whole assessment. So the nursing assessment revealed a flat red rash. It wasn't painful to the patient, and it blanched with gentle pressure. 
It was diffusely distributed over the patient's chest, torso, and I forgot to note the arm. Um, the patient stated that it started mid-afternoon, about two hours after his daily dose of INH. The patient was now in his second month of uh, latent TB infection treatment. He denied any changes in his routine, medications, and his vital signs were stable. So this is another kind of question here that you guys can put in the chat box. Um, what would be the most appropriate nursing action? So what are you guys thinking right now? Do we want to go ahead and draw, draw labs? We're already doing interventions. We're already putting our hands on the patient. Do we just want to keep that going? Do we want to hold the medication and call the doctor and see what he thinks? Do we have enough to, to call the doctor on? Do we send the patient to the emergency room? He is having an allergic reaction. Um, or do we just want to eh, send the patient home? He's not in distress. We can give him some Benadryl maybe and have him come back on Monday. What do we want to do? So what we did was we held the medication and we called the doctor. We shared all this information with the physician, and the physician ordered us to draw CDC and the CMP. Some rationale on that, and it always helps to know why we're doing things, is that it helps the physician to rule out any hematologic or liver abnormality. Um, he also wanted us to tell the patient to stop taking the medication and, if on hand, to leave that medication there at the clinic. The doctor also wanted the patient to be given 25 milligrams of Benadryl and, um, there in the clinic, and then also to take that every six hours as needed for itching. Um, and so remember, this patient is going to be going home, um, and it's a Friday. <laughs> So he also wanted us to educate the patient that if the condition worsens or he develops trouble breathing, to go directly to the emergency department. So we implemented those things. The labs were drawn. The patient was educated. Um, they, we, in, in our clinic, the process was always for the patients to bring their medications with them if um, they were uh, self-administered. And so we did take those medications from the patient. Um, the patient was also provided with the doctor's recommendations in writing for reference, um, just in case you know, their, their family members ask or they're forgetting what was said. And then the patient was scheduled to return to the clinic on Monday um, for reassessment. So the patient comes back into the clinic, um, and he reported that the rash resolved completely by Saturday morning. The labs were normal, and the clinic, the physician did opt to change the treatment regimen to rifampin for four months daily, and the INH was put as an allergy in the patient's chart, and that was communicated also to his primary physician. Not that they might ever give him that, but we, we were always kind of in communication with those primary care doctors. So just some highlights before we move on to the next section. <coughs> Reference materials enhance your description of the patient's reaction in addition to vital signs and other data. Gathering information regarding symptom onset and other factors help you to determine the causes other than drug rash, keeping the patient on their TB therapy. And teaching point, which is a term we love to use here at the Heartland, it's one of Dr. Vasquez at TCID's uh, great comments that she makes to bring attention to things, and this is actually one of her tips, guys, is to have the patient dis disrobe to an appropriately just to assess thoroughly, because remember, a patient might not be fully aware <coughs> of the severity of their reaction. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Catalina. Thank you, Iris. Um, the next section, I'm going to talk about what are drug rushes. So, oh, sorry. Uh, drugs can induce several different types of immunological reactions. So um, drug rushes are immunological reactions to a certain medication. When the immune system comes in contact to a, a medication, it can become sensitive to that particular drug, and this process is called sensitization. Uh, this is the typical drug reaction, a sensitization. Sometimes a person becomes sensitive to a drug after only one exposure, and other times sensitization occurs only after many exposures. So there is a classification of the allergic reactions that they can be classified as a immediate and non-immediate reactions, and it depends on the type of immune response. So that is the reason that the timing of the rashes vary from right away when the patient just takes the medications, or it can take some weeks, sometimes months, after the start of the offending medication. Uh, the rashes can range uh, from in severity, from mild discomfort, 
to life-threatening systemic reactions, the ones that we see in anaphylaxis. Uh, in this chart, um, you can see to the left, uh, like the immediate response that is possible induced by the IgE antibody, and this occurs in the first hour. Uh, the patient can develop urticaria, angioedema, runny nose, or any other allergic reaction, like any, any allergic reaction what we do, watery eyes. And to the right, you can see the non-immediate uh, reaction. Uh, it's commonly occurred after many hours or many days when the treatment was started with the offending medication, and this is related with the delayed T cell mechanism. So um, this kind of delayed type of um, response, um, you are going to see patients having maculopapular exanthema and delayed urticaria. Uh, something that is important to know is the most drug allergic reactions are the delayed type of response. What is the typical drug rush? What is the characteristic of a typical drug rush? The classic presentation of a drug rush is uh, this kind of maculopapular rash. Uh, they, these are like a bombs. Uh, they can be itching. Uh, macules are these uh, small, flat, red area of discoloration, and the papules are a small race, uh, red raised lesions. So in this picture, you can see the back of this patient is covered with a diffuse redness maculopapular um, uh, rash. Um, it's erythematous, it's red, it's red, and because the rock rashes are systemic reactions, um, often start in one part of the body. Most of the time, you are going to see rashes starting in the trunk, in the chest, or in the back, and spread to other areas of the body. Um, this can last for two to 21 days, and most of the time, typical drug rash uh, don't compromise hands or feet. Um, so if you have a patient that is taking some of these TB medications and the patient complains of rash in one hand or in one leg or maybe in the shoulder, um, and it's the only um, location that they have, keep in mind that maybe it's not related with, a, with any medication. But it's important to evaluate. So the rashes cause by medication can be grouped in three. The first one is the one that I am talking about, a rash caused by an allergic reaction. The second rash due to medication is um, related to side effects of the medication. And the third one is rashes caused for extreme sensitivity to the sunlight that is caused by that medication. Uh, this is the list of the first-line medications to treat tuberculosis. I included also the fluoroquinolones, and if you see side effects, all of these medications can have rash or hypersensitivity as a side effect. So this is the challenge to treat a patient with TB with these first-line drugs. I'm going to show you just three cases of rashes as side effects, the most common that we have seen. Uh, the first one is the acne. Uh, acne is characterized by inflammatory postures, uh, sometimes blisters. Uh, they are located primary in the upper body, uh, primary in the face or in the shoulder or in the chest. Um, it may take weeks or months to develop and this is one of the side effects of the INH. So the, the acne can go from mild to severe, and it, the doctor may decide to stop the INH and to switch to another TB medication, or if it's a mild acne, um, the doctor 
probably is going to continue with the INH and just uh, treat the agony. Uh, another side effect is the drug-induced photosensitivity, and this is one of the side effects, especially with the clofacimin, that is one of the medications that is being used more frequently now for the treatment of tuberculosis. And also you are going to see some of this photosensitivity with the use of the fluoroquinolones. Um, this uh, induced photosensitivity is the result of a combined effect on, of the chemical and the light. Um, it's like a dye deposit in the skin that reacts with, to the light. So most of the time the patient can start taking clofacimin for months, and with time you are going to start seeing the patient like a, getting a dark color in the skin. You, we have patients here at the TB hospital, and we can see them, and with the time that they are taking the clofacimin, they start getting this suntan appearance in the face. So it's really important to educate the patient uh, about using sunscreen on wear protective clothing uh, to avoid this um, uh, hyperpigmentation. Uh, in most patients, the prognosis is excellent once the offending medication is removed. Um, however, complete resolution of this um, hyperpig hyperpigmentation may take several weeks to months. Um, just for your information, clofacimin, 80% of the patients taking clofacimin can have this uh, side effect. The um, fungal infection is one of the consequences of long-term antibiotic use, and especially with the fluoroquinolones. Um, we had a patient, she was diabetic, she was a patient with MDR-TB, she was receiving treatment with second-line medications, and when she was like a eight months on, on treatment, she developed rash in the abdomen. Uh, she was a little overweight, so she has uh, some uh, full skin in the abdomen, and it was described as an itchy rash in this warm, moist, full area of the ad abdomen. Uh, this is a picture of um, similar reaction that she has. You can see here that it was it's, uh, like a maculopapular reaction. It's red. Uh, it's a satellite lesion because it was just located in the full area and also under the breast. Um, you can see that the area is, is looks like wet. Uh, so it was localized. It was not a typical allergy. A rush due to medications, so it was um, diagnosed as a candida albicans, so she was treated for fungal infection due to the fluoroquinolones, but the TB meds were not uh, stopped. Okay, now um, I'm going to show you some of the drug um, rushes due to TB meds. Uh, the first one is this case, a uh, recent case of a 12-year-old boy in treatment for TB infection with daily uh, rifampin. Um, he got an allergic reaction to rifampin after three weeks on treatment. Um, the doctor who was, who was treating this boy, um, he, she called us and she described the itching like a severe rash that the patient complained of itching, and hives are described by swollen red bumps or plaques. It looks like wheels on the skin that appear suddenly. That is the description of hives, and this boy had everything. Uh, if you, these are pictures of the patient. Uh, now, with the magic of the cell phones, we can take pictures and send it right away to the doctors. Uh, to the consultant, so she sent us these pictures um, asking for recommendation and what to do now. Uh, you see that this is really a severe reaction. Um, you see the hives that are confluent and 
she didn't want to um, do a re-challenge, and she decided to change this patient from refamping uh, for treatment for TBI to INH for nine months. And she gave, of course, Benadryl uh, at the clinic when she, she get this uh, reaction. This is another case of urticaria that is uh, related with the hives. Uh, this is a patient with uh, INH-resistant TB that was receiving treatment with rifampin, etambutol, and libo, and she developed a severe rash at the end of the treatment. Um, the rash was located in lower and upper extremities, and these are the pictures that the nurses send us. Um, it, it was not a typical rash. Um, she didn't have any rash in the abdomen or in the back. It was just located in the upper and lower extremities. If you see, um, we can say that this is a well-defined race, erythematous, and a rash with large confluent redness. Um, in the left picture, you can see some scratch marks in the left leg. Uh, so it, it was not a typical rash. However, this is a pitching point. Even though it's not a typical rash, it's, the TB meds should be stopped. And you need to perform a careful evaluation. So the TB meds were stopped. Up, and the nurses, like a one or two weeks later, they send us pictures because the rash was not uh, resolving, the rash progressive, and uh, it now involves palms, uh, abdomen, and if you see the rash in the um, legs were different. They changed from the, this uh, diffuse um, confluent rash to a rash that like, looks like um, mosquito bites. Um, she also had a swollen face and body. Uh, so the doctor decided to end the treatment. Uh, this rash uh, um, was present at the end of the treatment. She, was, she already received 85 to 90% of the treatment, so the doctor decided to end the treatment, and at the end, Rickettsia, that is one infection that is uh, seen along the U.S.-Mexico border, was ruling out in this case. Allergic reaction with ripe. Who hasn't had this <laughs> problem? Uh -huh. This is uh, one case of a 16-year-old boy uh, with low-level INH resistance. He was studied in RIPE in August 2015 in one of the border, uh, border towns in Texas, uh, in Laredo. Um, they started RIPE because they didn't receive the susceptibilities at the beginning, so he started with RIPE. He tolerated really well the treatment for one month. Then uh, he was having some headaches, some migraines, and the mom gave him some medication for the mig ma migraines. And he started with a rash. Um, he was taken to Mexico uh, to be treated for the rash and for the headaches. He needed to be admitted, and he received uh, injections to treat the, the rash, but the LFTs uh, uh, were elevated. So all this information was given to the nurses, uh, and the nurses in Laredo, Texas, they decided to stop the TB treatment and to um, schedule the patient to a visit to the clinic to uh, start re-challenge when the rash uh, uh, resolves. So the patient came to the clinic, uh, and they tried to do the re-challenge because they didn't know what was the cause of the rash. Uh, they start the re-challenge, and Maribel is going to talk later about the re-challenge uh, for uh, the drug rashes. Uh, they start with refamping, and 20 minutes after the refamping was given, the boy started with this uh, rash. Uh, he had hives um, in the torso, in the back. Um, it was a really severe reaction uh, through all the body. Um, he also had a, uh, some of these hives in the neck and in the face. So the uh, 
nurses sent to the patient to the ER, uh, in, and from ER he was sent to San Antonio, uh, to a hospital, children's hospital in San Antonio, and the doctor uh, wanted to start a re-challenge with rifaburi and steroid. It was the recommendation given uh, by the expert. Uh, this is part of the same reaction that she had in the clinic. Uh, you can see the, the small papules, red, and the, the, it, it was itching also. Unfortunately, he was in the hospital. The doctor tried to do the rechallenge, but he was not able to tolerate the rifabutin. So this patient, uh, patient ended having a treatment for 18 months with a tambutol, PTA, and MOXIE. He was treated almost like an MDR because he was INH resistant and not didn't tolerate the refab. How about when you have a patient with HIV and tuberculosis and develop rash? Why people with HIV develop rash? There are some reasons. We all know that uh, the uh, patients with HIV have the immune system really compromised, so there is an increased incidence of bacterial infections. So rashes in patients with HIV can be caused for other conditions like shingles, Kaposi sarcoma. It could be rashes due to the HIV infection itself, itself like a acute retroviral syndrome. It could be rashes related with the antiretroviral medications or rashes uh, by another medications like the TB meds. So this is the case of a 29-year-old male with HIV, uh, no adherence to the HIV treatment. Um, he had recurrent tuberculosis disseminated it happened in 2018. He was refumping resistant, and he was receiving treatment with uh, second-line medications. The patient was responding good to the treatment, but after two months, he developed rash. Uh, these are the pictures that the nurses sent to us. Um, if they are not good pictures. You cannot see really well, but the a rash was a widely a itchy rash, not typical rash. Um, they said that uh, it was worse in groins, so it was not the, the typical rash. And he was seen by a doctor in, in, the, in Merci, uh, Mexico, and the doctor uh, diagnosed with a erythroderma, uh, but he also had uh, another problem, and he was receiving penicillin uh, for syphilis. So the rash was not clear if it was because of the TB meds, because the penicillin, or because any other infection. So uh, at the end, it was um, not a drug, a rash that is not related to a drug. But uh, two weeks later, they sent us these pictures that the rash was worsening. So. If you see, this is a really nice picture of the, this patient's rash, uh, because if you find a rash like this one, you can see that it's a dry skin, but it's peeling. The, 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 the skin is peeling. So as the skin peels, it starts shedding layers uh, of old damaged skin and replaces with new skin. So this is the typical healing process of a rash that before was swollen, inflamed, red. Uh, so if you see this kind of rash, uh, keep in mind that it probably is the typical post-inflammatory desquamation or scaling. And you, you see this uh, kind of scaling when you have a sunburn. So this is another rash that you can find in your patients taking a uh, TB treatment. Rashes in children. Uh, most rashes caused by, uh, in children are caused by viral infections. Uh, the children can have any uh, viral infection, cellulitis, chickenpox, measles, and it's really difficult to differentiate. Uh, it's important to do, uh, to do a good evaluation, uh, and this picture is actual 
uh, actually our Irish granddaughter. Yes, <laughs> that, she's a cutie pie. <laughs> she had, uh, like a two months ago, she had this kind of rash. And uh, do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, I can give a quick background. So um, she had actually experienced some lethargy um, and some fever. Next morning, woke up to this rash. So uh, my daughter took her to Dell Children's Hospital. And um, we thought was she, well, yeah, I thought she was going to be admitted, but I was in grandma brain, and I just wanted her to be rescued. Um, but apparently this was adenovirus, and um, so the physician said as long as she was taking in water and she was, uh, you know, wetting her diapers and stuff, that it was viral, so we needed to let it run its course. So it took about four to five days of just supportive measures um, for her, and um, the rash did resolve, but it was all over. It was not just the arms. It was her trunk. It was her legs, her buttocks, her back. So, you know, she was very uncomfortable. It wasn't itchy, but it was warm to the touch, um, and the virus really just knocked her down. And, and then this is just to point that in kids, in children, um, she was not taking treatment for TB, but if you have a child taking treatment for tuberculosis, it rushes most of the time are caused by viral infections than the, for, as a drug allergy. So keep in mind this. Uh, this is a child that um, was treated for pre-XDR TB and she developed rash. He was in treatment for pre-XDR, he was receiving injectables uh, and second line medications and like uh, eight months in treatment. He, uh, the nurse just sent us this picture that the baby, was, the child was having red, irritated rash in face, chin, and neck. And that was the only location of the rash. Uh, you can see here like a pigmentation, a plague, um, like a race, these papules. Uh, but if you see closely, the teacher, you can see that the teacher is wet. So he ended having a fungal infection due to drooling and the TB meds were not stopped, and she was successfully treated uh, for pre-XDR. Uh, OK, TB rashes. Uh, this is a subject that maybe is, uh, is going to be good for another webinar. It could be part two. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to show you uh, three uh, severe cases of uh, rashes. The first one is a case of psoriasis as a comorbid condition that worsened with TB treatment. So this is a 41-year-old Vietnamese uh, patient with underlying psoriasis. Um, this psoriasis worsened when she started treatment for TB. He, ha he needed admission to the TB hospital, and the psoriasis uh, were really bad. The, you can see in the face red patches uh, on the red patches on face and in the back, this flaking inflammation. You can see like a white, silvery patches. The, the skin is shedding, is peeling off. She, these are pictures of the patient here at the hospital. The doctors were able to um, premedicate her with Benadryl and prednisone, and she was successfully treated but it was a worse in psoriasis due to TB med. Uh, Steven Johnson, like uh, I just uh, talked a little bit, is another serious disorder. Uh, it's usually a reaction to a medication. It's life-threatening reaction. Uh, it always involves mucus area. And the last one is the dress syndrome. It's a life-threatening um, a situation, a life-threatening allergic reaction, hypersensitivity to uh, medication, uh, and it involves um, organs. Uh, you can see swollen of the liver uh, and uh, systemic symptoms like inflammation of the liver, lung, and heart. So now is Maribel's time. Thank you for that, Catalina. Yes, and so. Um, you know, what if your patient does develop a rash? And I know Catalina mentioned just a bit ago in her presentation about the drug rechallenge. So that's what I'm going to talk about now, um, is the drug rechallenge with RIPE. 
So this is basically an approach that Hartman takes in order to find out the drug that's causing this rash. And it should only be used for patients who are at low risk for anaphylaxis. So, um, you know, if your patient had a, a rash that included, you know, hives, swelling, or trouble breathing, then they're not a good candidate for this. Um, and it should be done in a clinical setting. And you want to make sure that the rash has completely subsided before you even begin this drug rechallenge. Um, and we're doing it today with RIPE. That is uh, under the assumption that you're still pending susceptibilities. Again, that's going to be the driving force. But for now, we're going to assume we have no susceptibilities, and we're going to go ahead and uh, start with a drug rechallenge. So basically what it is is we're introducing one new drug a week, and that's going to you know, help us to find out which drug is causing the problem. So we start with rifampin. And the reason why we start with rifampin is because it is the most important drug, and it will have the greatest impact on your treatment regimen if you're able to use it. So what we do is in the clinic for the first dose, we want to have the patient come in. We want them to pre-medicate 30 minutes before we give that rifampin with Benadryl and prednisone. Um, and we're going to start off at a low dose of 300 milligrams because this is going to help to blunt a reaction if it is going to occur. So uh, you give the medication in the clinic, assuming everything goes well, nothing, no reactions after 30 minutes, the patient can go home. And then you do want them to come back for day two. And we're going to do essentially the same thing with the pre-medication. Uh, and this time we're going to increase that rifampin dose to 600 milligrams have them wait out in the lobby uh, 30 minutes, make sure they're doing fine, uh, that nothing's going on with reactions. And if everything goes good, they can go home. And then day three, what we're going to do is we're going to only pre-medicate with the Benadryl. And we're going to continue again 600 milligrams on the rifampin. All goes well there. We're going to switch to day four, where we're going to uh, remove all pre-medications and just simply give the rifampin at the 600 milligram dose. Now, it is also important to hand the patient some weekend packets. You want to make sure that they continue taking the medication through the weekend. The second medication for week two, once we've established that rifampin is good, there's no reaction there, it's going to be isoniazid. And we're essentially going to do the same thing that we did with rifampin, starting off with pre-medication. And then we'll start again with a low dose of INH, and that'll be at 150 milligrams. In the clinic, again, you're going to have them wait for those 30 minutes, make sure that there's no reaction. And um, once they go home, day two, again, should be in the clinic. And we're going to pre-medicate. And this time, what we're going to do is increase that INH to the 300 milligram dose. So again, watch in the clinic, make sure that the patient doesn't have any kind of reaction. Um, if all goes well, then on day three, Again, as before, uh, we're going to pre-medicate only with Benadryl, and we're going to give, again, the INH at 300 milligrams. Then, if all goes well on day four through day six, we're going to want them to continue through the weekend, we're going to remove the pre-medication. So they'll be taking um, the rifampin and INH alone without any pre-medication. So then on week three, uh, again, assuming you, don't, you do not have any susceptibility studies in yet, you should also re-challenge with a Sambitol. And basically, it's the same as we did with week one and two. Uh, we're going to start day one pre-medicating with Benadryl and prednisone. You're going to do the Sambitol at 100 milligram dose. Um, that's the lowest dose, again, just to kind of help blunt out if there's going to be any kind of reaction. If all goes well, uh, after 30 minutes, the patient can go home. And then on day two, when they return, we'll just go ahead and increase that ethambitol to the full dose. And again, that's going to be calculated based on the patient's weight. So day three, again, pre-medicate just with Benadryl. Give the full dose of your ethambitol. Assuming all goes well, it's going to be the same for day um, four through the weekend. So again, this is just assuming, again, that it's going to be a re-challenge with RIPE. Some key points that I wanted to you know, point out to you all is you do want to make sure to start this re-challenge on a Monday or a Tuesday. It's just going to make for better flow. You do want to pre-medicate with those uh, antihistamine, the steroid, the Benadryl, and the prednisone. And if at any point 
through the rechallenge, any medication is not tolerated, of course you want to stop, you want to identify the medication, and you want to document. So you really want to describe that reaction so that we can uh, provide adequate uh, information to the physician. So Catalina and Iris just went through some great uh, verbiage, the way we should be describing these rashes. So that's very important and key. And then you do want to wait until the rash resolves completely before you continue with the drug challenge and adding a new medication. And also you want to make sure that the medications are going to be taken on the weekend. Okay, so given all of that and everything that we've kind of gone through, I wanted to go through um, a brief case study on a 3HP case. So we'll go ahead and get started there. So this is a 32-year-old US-born female. She was a household contact to a person with TB disease. She had a positive T-spot. She was negative for HIV. She was asymptomatic. Her chest x-ray was normal. She had an unremarkable past medical history. She was not on any medication. She had no known drug allergies. Um, her social history, no tobacco use, alcohol use, IV drug use, or any other drugs. So the physician did order for her to start on 3-HP for the three months, standard 12 doses. Um, and that would include the rifepentine, the isoniazid, and the vitamin B6. So as we know, with 3-HP, it, it's done by DOT, and it is once a week. So the patient comes in to have her first dose in the clinic. She is seen by the nurse, has her baseline assessment, baseline labs, and she's administered uh, the first dose of 3-HP, and she's asked to sit out in the lobby, uh, and the nurse goes out, you know, have her sit there for 30 minutes. The nurse went out to check on the patient, and other than the patient feeling nervous, everything was fine. She didn't have any kind of reaction, so yay to that. That's what we always want to hear, right? Um, they did establish that her D, uh, medication was going to be given in her home, so a DOT worker would be going out to her residence. So after that day, um, a week later, with dose number two, that was given in her home. So the DOT worker went to her house, did the uh, toxicity screen, went through the checklist, and the patient denied having any kind of uh, side effects or symptoms from her first dose. Um, so the DOT worker went ahead and gave her her second dose of 3-HP. So everything was fine up until the fourth day after that. She did develop rash with hives, but luckily that did resolve within 24 hours, so the following day on Sunday, the symptoms resolved. However, the nurse and the doctor were not notified until that Monday. So um, the patient was asked to come in, labs were drawn, and actually she did speak with the physician as well. At that point, the physician opted to go ahead and move forward with giving her the third dose of her 3-HP, just counseling the patient that, of course, if any symptoms recurred for her to visit the emergency room, if it was after hours or if it was on the weekend. So her labs came back and everything was fine, and it just so happened that well, her third dose was given on a Friday. So again, the DOT worker uh, arrives to the home, does her toxicity screen, the patient's that she's fine, um, everything has kind of subsided by then, and she's given her third dose. So again, it's Friday, the DOT worker goes home, and this time the patient uh, did experience headache, blurry vision, nausea, vomiting, and chills. Uh, she did say the symptoms resolved the following day, so just as before, within the 24-hour period time, which is great, um, and then Again, we weren't, uh, the clinic was not notified until that following Monday. So at that point, the physician was called in order to stop the 3-HP uh, treatment, and the new orders were going to be to start uh, rifampin for four months. So at this point, the patient actually had already set a small vacation, so she didn't return back to the U.S. until about two weeks later, which was actually great. It gave her body a little bit of time to cool off from that reaction. So two weeks later, uh, we're getting ready to start the new LTBI treatment with Lufamp, and the patient returns to the clinic. And again, as before, the nurse uh, that sees her performs her assessment again, draws labs, makes sure everything is fine, and she administers the first dose of the Lufamp there in clinic. Um, 
Mrs. Hatcher sit out in the lobby, just as before, to make sure she's not going to have uh, any kind of reaction. So 15 minutes later, the nurse checks on the patient, and the patient states that she is feeling fine. Again, the nerves are there, but other than that, she's doing good. 30 minutes later, the patient says she continues to feel fine. So great, everything's going good. The nurse hands her her appointment card for the following month for her monthly toxicity screen because, again, rifampin is going to be self-administered, so she'll be taking that at home every day. So she dis dismisses the patient. So the patient walks out, and a few minutes later, she walks back in. She returns to the clinic, and at this point, she's complaining of itching, swelling to her upper lip, shortness of breath, and tightness in her chest. So what happened? And yes, you guessed it, she was experiencing anaphylaxis. The one thing that we don't want to see in the clinics, but unfortunately it's reality and it happened. So uh, the nurses uh, jumped into action, took her to the back. Everybody kind of gathered, was delegated uh, um, different. Someone was taking blood pressure, other people were getting oxygen. So on assessment, the patient was found to have mild to moderate respiratory distress diffuse wheezing, shallow breathing. Her blood pressure was at 106 over 68, which is not too bad. Her pulse was, as expected, at 130. She did have arithmetic eyes. Blotching of her skin was diffuse rash. She had some papules on her lips, and she was observed to be scratching. And of course, as you can imagine, she was tremulous and frightened. So this is just, this is not the patient, but I wanted you guys to just have a look at how um, it, you might see your patient when they're beginning to have the onset of anaphylaxis. So to your left, you can see the papules that are starting to come out on the lips. And to your right, you can see the arrhythmatous eyes. Again, this would be at the initiation of an anaphylaxis. Of course, if there's no help or intervention, it may get progressively worse very fast. So. Luckily for this patient, the clinic was just on point. She was given some oxygen. An EpiPen was available, so she was given the epinephrine, as well as oral Benadryl. EMS was called while all of this was going on. A doctor was also called to come on site. And once EMS arrived, the patient was given 60 milligrams of prednisone. Now, uh, the patient did respond very well to all of those interventions, so it was recommended that she not have to be transferred to the ER. She was watched there in the clinic for one hour, and she was eventually sent home on Benadryl and steroids for the following 24 hours. So the outcome of this was a good outcome. The patient did have complete resolution of all of her symptoms. Uh, there was a consultation made with an expert physician. And then new orders were implemented. This time it would be with the uh, isoniazid for nine months. Just some key points to remember here. Um, if a particular medication has been identified as a likely culprit in a severe allergic reaction, like anaphylaxis, um, you do not re-challenge with this medication, and you want to make sure to suspend its use permanently. Um, and it's very good to educate and counsel your patient never to use the offending medication and to avoid medications that are from the same drug class. So we just need to you know, educate them and let them know what kind of medication class it falls into when they go to a new PCP, when they're changing jobs, and they're filling out all those forms. You want them to be able to inform the physician so we can avoid any kind of reaction like this ever occurring again. So now that we've discussed the characteristics of a drug rash and how to appropriately describe them, we can provide better assessment findings when we're reporting all this to our physicians. So um, Andrea, if you have any, did you want to give any input? If not, we can go ahead and open up for some questions. Nope. Okay, well I just wanted to remind everybody also that if you have any questions uh, regarding the drug reach challenge or if you have a patient and you're just unsure, you can definitely reach out to Heartland uh, with a consult. Our information is on our website, uh, either myself, Iris, or Catalina. You can contact us by phone. Our phone numbers are on there or by email, and we'll be more than happy to consult you with uh, the drug rash, a re-challenge, or any other questions that you may have.